This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. I've missed everybody. We tolerated an ice storm last week. When they tried to bring one up again this week, we started rebuking. And uh, it just... Oh, we're not going to have one every week, and that's just crazy. Get 60 during the week, and when I have an ice age every weekend, that's not right. You know, if I could give a title to today's message, it almost sounds like a theological white paper. The Kingdom, Temporal and Spiritual Realities and Dynamic Tension. Everybody said, oh, great. But I want to deal with the paradox that the kingdom is now, but not yet. If you have your Bibles today, I want to turn to the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. You know, I am perplexed at the things that I see across the body of Christ, that we have ministries not acting very biblical. We have sermons that are more pep talks that you can go to the same thing and, and listen to Tony Robbins or one of those guys on the secular side trying to tell you how great you are and pat you on the back when the truth is all of us need Jesus. And we need His kingdom now. And when we, we, we cease to be kingdom focused, we get into the political stuff of the church. And there are ministers that I know that I love that are pastoring sometimes three, four, five, six thousand members, and they're nominally theological, but what they have learned is how to play the political machine within the church. And I would rather have someone who hates the political system and won't be a part of it, but just simply preaches the word in season in and out. You don't hear the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy, which was the last book that he wrote, saying, Timothy, play the system. It's not there. It's preach the word in season and out. And we need to return back to publicity because it's the very foundation of our faith. It's the very source of our strength. And everywhere around us, the word of God is being attacked. It's being attacked by those in the pulpit. It's being attacked by those in university. It's being attacked by those in the secular media on every front. You know, I don't hear them going after the Quran. I don't hear them going after the writings of Buddha. I don't hear them going after all these different ones, Confucius, Zoeaster. None of them. It's always the Word of God. Because out of all the pantheons of gods that have been on the planet... You say there are other gods? Yes, they are. They're fallen Nephilim, when you understand what's really going on. They're fallen angels. They're children of the fallen angels that have been venerated by humanity. And they're all alike. They're worse than most of the humans that they want to worship them. You know what I mean? You start studying the Greek gods, 
And they'll steal your women, steal your bread, burn down your barn, and create wars just because they have bets with one another. Who wants to serve a God like that? God's different. I remember years ago I was sitting in a colloquium down in Atlanta, Georgia. And Dr. Isaac was there, and I still remember him. I mean, he survived the Holocaust, and his eyebrows were almost bigger than most people's hairline. <laughs> He was a hoot. Theological depth. Rosenberg was his last name, Dr. Isaac Rosenberg. And he said, the God of the Bible is rude. He comes on the scene, says, I'm God. I rule over the other gods. There's none like me. And if you want to walk with me, here's my set of rules. He says, but you can be extremely rude when you're extremely right and everybody else is wrong. And yet we think today that we can take social norms and transform the Word of God. That would have really worked in Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's working about the same way today. We, we have got to have this kingdom. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, it's not just a mantra that you say. It's a pattern of prayer. It's an outline of what needs to be included in your prayer life. And the reason that Jesus gave this to them as they said, listen, you're getting results like nobody we've ever seen. You're not like the scribes. You're not like the Pharisees. You're certainly not like the Sadducees. When it, when it comes time to, that people need help, they'll say, well, in the day of Moses, oh, when Elijah was here, all the great miracles that we could have seen, but they don't have anything but their political and theological games. And so Jesus, you, you blow all that apart. You come and you start healing the sick. You start giving sight to the blind. The cripple are walking. You're always in the face of the, of the religious leaders telling us that we better live better than they do if we want to get into heaven. How should we pray? He said, in this manner, in this manner, so that this, we, we could do this if we were doing PowerPoint and bullet points of what the Lord was giving. The first thing is, I need your name to be hallowed. I want your name to be hallowed, which actually goes with the Ten Commandments. Take not the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know what that means, literally? It's not about saying GD this and GD that, although that's not good to do either. Whenever... There's, there's this real interesting thing about the ironic blessing. And God said, God said, listen, Moses, I want you to teach the sons of Aaron how to put my name on the children of Israel. And then they speak the ironic blessing. And so everybody today is enamored with the secret sauce of the ironic blessing, this over and over again. This is the secrets to the ironic blessing. And then the rabbis, you know, they do the Vulcan thing and they do it twice, trying to, trying to, uh, trying to create a, a uh, sheen to cast over the people, kind of like you have on the mezuzah. And they're, they're trying everything except what's there. Hebrew paints a picture. May the face of the Lord shine upon you. May he be gracious to me. May he lift up his countenance upon you. How can he lift up his countenance upon you if it's already shining on you? Do you ever think about that? But what happens, grandparents or parents, when you've been away from your children or you're bringing a new child into your household? What is the first thing that happens? Your face lights up, doesn't it? Okay. You're gracious to that child, and then you pick that child up, and you hold them up, and it causes your countenance to be lifted and then you wrap them in your arms and you give them shalom. The sons of Aaron were speaking the spirit of adoption over Israel. Okay, now you got my name. I just adopted you, you got my name. So the way that you conduct yourself, how you live, and all these other things, you either make the name of God vain, useless, to be trampled down, or you make it holy and respected. There was a time in America that even the mafia feared the church. 
I mean, the politician feared them, but I mean, when you get mafia fearing them, you got something going on, okay? But we have, we have lost this sense of carrying the name of God. We have lost this sense of what it means that, that it's, it's like, Lord, I want big numbers on the weekend for church. Lord, I want lots of followers on YouTube. That's what I need. Lord, I need to have 10,000 followers on Facebook's what I need. I need everybody to remember my name. No, 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 no. It's remembering his name. I remember here a couple years ago down in Dallas, a bunch of us conference speakers were gathering together in this kind of, of uh, talk and shop. And uh, we brought up the fact, wouldn't it be so cool if the only way they could remember our names is they looked on the back of the DVD after the conference was over because all they remember is that they had been with Jesus. Now that would be a conference. Who spoke? Jesus. How many times? About 10. He used a lot of different vessels, but it was Jesus speaking. Lord, let your name be hallowed. This word in Greek, hegiadzo, means to render or to make venerable. It means to sanctify, to make it holy. But it's, it's, it's this, this thing of, of us saying, God, I want you to be respected in the earth. I want you to be, the way that I live my life, that this is the first step to moving in kingdom power. When it's not about us, it's about the king and about representing him and wanting to make sure that he's the one who gets the respect. In my life, in my family, when somebody looks at my family, may they say, there's something different about them. That I, I feel this fear of God, this respect for God around them. They don't just visit God. They're actually part of the family. And, the, and you can feel the king ruling and reigning in their midst. Only when we begin praying, Lord, may your name be hallowed, can we start praying your kingdom come. Now, in dealing with the kingdom come, how many know that I'd like to be in the millennial reign right now? No bureaucracy, no politics, no devil, no sickness or disease. Hospitals would be emptied. That there would be peace on earth in an unprecedented way with Jesus physically ruling and reigning on heaven, you know, on, on, in Jerusalem. I can't even imagine that. That just sounds so cool. All the news media would all be about what is the king saying today. The prophet said that out of, out of Jerusalem when he reigns would flow the law of God. Absolute wisdom, absolute power, absolute majesty. Oh. I almost can't wrap my head around it. When you look at the mess that's in the world today, and the mess that we have had all the years, you look at the mess of what's going on in Washington, you look at the mess of what's going on with the UN, uh, this mess, mess, and all it is, every, every time you open up another can, it's a deeper, deeper, more corrupt mess. How many of that stops when Jesus comes back? And you say, man, I'm going to have power over the devil. He ain't going to be there. He's bound up for a thousand years. There's not going to be a demon. There's not going to be a devil. The principalities and powers have been all pushed back. Man. I almost can't fathom that. That's what, that's what comes with the king. Now, Jesus, in this one, he said, let your, let your kingdom come. This Greek word translated come. And I'll, now I looked at this is for it to come, for it to arrive, for it to make an appearance. But I begin to look at the sense of the, the verbiage in the Greek. And it is active, and it's imperative. It's not, Lord, someday. I know someday when you come back and you split the Mount of Olives, someday your kingdom's going to get here. This is, I need it now. I implore heaven, bring the kingdom now. The closest thing I can, 
I can equate to it are like soldiers on the battlefield that call for aerial backup. And all of a sudden the bombs start flying and the enemy gets roasty toasty. You know what I mean? It's like, I need it now. That was the imperative that Jesus was giving. Let your name be reverenced and let your kingdom come now and let your will be done in this earthen vessel. It's got to start with me. I want in this old mud pot right here, I want your will to be done. This, this is if I was walking the streets of glory and I'm getting direct commission from you to do something and the power and the provision to do it. That's what I need now in my life. That's how you replicate the ministry of Jesus. You see, it's not even speaking in tongues. And all the Pentecostals went, <gasps> because I have known too many Pentecostals. They speak in tongues all day long, and they don't have enough power in them to make a, la a ladyfinger firecracker. They light their fuse, and it goes, <laughs> that's it. And then you walk around saying, I got more power than the Baptist. <laughs> yeah. Watch this. And all you end up doing is having the power to create more and more drama in your local congregation. Not life-changing. Maybe life-draining, but not life-changing. When the kingdom manifests what we see in the Word of God, first there is a deep reverential fear of Almighty God. He is respected. How can you tell when you start walking in the reverential fear of God? I'll not do that because I respect God too much. It seems that today's believers are all about, what can I get away with and still get into heaven? He, 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 he. You got to be kidding me. Get out of the nursery. It's how can I cause men to respect him around me? Second, there is a deeper respect for the word of God. That's why James said that we need with a spirit of meekness, we need to receive the engrafted word because it's supposed to fix us. We don't change the word of God. The word is here to say, listen, you're wrong. You need a savior. And here's how to get saved. If you take away the wrong part... There's no leading to a Savior. And the world's doing that. The church is doing that. I have heard sermons where they're trying to break up the Greek and the Hebrew to prove that sin is okay. And it's like if you're standing on your head half drunk with one eye open, maybe. And you rearrange all the letters of that Greek word to mean something else or that Hebrew word to mean something else. It, it, is, it is such a consternation to me that they will do gymnastics to justify their sin nature instead of exercising their knees in repentance to change their sin nature. I also found out that there's a great awareness of the holiness of God and our need to walk in holiness as citizens of the kingdom. What is going to separate the remnant in the days ahead is not having a remnant emblazoned, you know, emblazoned on your t-shirt. That doesn't make you remnant. Your respect for God, your reverence for the Word, and walking in personal holiness, sanctification. Somehow or another, the church today has made sanctification a four-letter word when it was actually the battle cry of the Reformation. It was the battle cry of every single revival that we have ever had since the day of Pentecost. It's come, receive the Savior, leave paganism behind, and now sanctify yourselves to Him. The more that I repent and walk according to this, the more that the King can use me for His purposes. Now, the body of Christ as a whole has stopped seeking the kingdom in prayer. 
They really have. Give us our, their, this day our stats from demographics to see what we're supposed to preach. Let us be able to get more YouTube clicks or improve our ratings on such and such a channel. You think I'm, I'm not kidding. You gauge what you preach based upon how it affects the offering. That's why we don't take one. Sitting there on the back table. We don't take one. I don't care if five million dollars is put in the plate or there isn't a penny put in the plate. It's never going to change what I preach. I found out that I serve the God that owns the cattle on the thousand hills and all the taters and the gold underneath. And he can pay it in gold, he can pay it in taters. It doesn't matter to me as long as it gets paid if it's what he wants done. Instead of walking like the faithful in the book of Acts, we conduct ourselves more like the religious leaders that Jesus was constantly rebuking in the New Testament. I find that more and more as I deal with situations across the body of Christ. There's no integrity. It's not. I'm dealing with a situation right now that is just absolutely unconscionable with one of our graduates and has, has physically, financially harmed this man because they won't even keep their word nor investigate properly. I mean, there's biblical protocols on how you handle stuff in the New Testament. Forget, you know, Mike, you're preaching the Old Testament. Let's set the Old Testament aside. Let's set Torah aside. And let's just follow the instruction of the New Testament. They ain't doing none of that. And I hear that over and over and over again. I had a student that was pastoring a church that kept on talking for the need of revival, the need of revival, the need of revival. And so revival broke out in vacation Bible school. And I don't know how many kids, it's like 20, 30 kids got saved. I mean, revolutionized that entire neighborhood around the church. Do you know what the board's response was? They fired him. You know how much work that's going to be handling that many kids in church? What were you thinking? Excuse me, maybe the Holy Spirit was after the next generation to make a difference. There's no real understanding or the depth in the Word of God in the current generation. If you base your theology on what you hear on Christian TV, you're in sad shape. If you base your theology by Christian music, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. I don't know how many times Mary and I say, well, that song sounded really good, but it was theologically inaccurate here, and inaccurate here, and inaccurate here. One example. Jesus did not rob the grave. He conquered it. Sounds like he was able to get out of, out of Walgreens with a Snickers bar <laughs> instead of defeating the greatest foe, the final foe that faces humanity. The Apostle Paul said, death is the final foe. And looking at what Jesus did, he said, he said, grave, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? That isn't stealing, dude. That is conquering. And it can go on. I think before you need to be a praise and worship writer, you better go through some systematic theology and some basic hermeneutics to make sure that it may rhyme, but it could also be a crime when it comes to theological accurateness, okay? I can't do like Randy. There's no reverential fear of God, and there's, no, there's more politics than holiness, guys. I tell you right now, the political side of things, I'll bomb out, I'll blow it up, I'll do I'll, whatever i got to do to get rid of it. I will not be a part of it. Sometimes I have been, there have been a lot of places I have been uninvited to. That's okay. Because I don't play the games. It's all about the king. Here's one thing that the Holy Spirit spoke to me very strong this morning. He said, the kingdom brings the fear of the Lord and then creates fearless warriors for the cause of Christ. When we fear God, we stop fearing the world. But when you 
fear the world, you'll stop respecting God. Now, here's a lesson for the Laodicean church. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and 33. How many know we need a paradigm adjustment? The Laodicean church thought they had it made. They had wealth. That, that, that area was extremely, extremely wealthy. They probably even beat Trump on unemployment. I think it was probably at zero percent. Extremely wealthy. The, the linens that they could make with the, with the royal blue and the purple were was for number one, very expensive, used by kings. <laughs> and that was the number one place in the world to get it. And so highly affluent city. And Jesus rebuked them from one end to the other, which we're getting ready to get into. But look at this, what he says in Matthew six thirty three. But seek first the hundredfold return. But seek first the prosperity of God. Seek first la de moula rue. Lots of money, that way you can be big tithers. No. Seek first the kingdom. He, can, he was teaching them kingdom. Seek the rule and reign of Messiah, the kingdom now. When you do that... He says, and all these other things will be added to you. In other words, what we consider major priorities, heaven considers trinkets. You know, there are people richer in Africa than there are in America. They may have a dirt floor and all they got is a broom to sweep it with, but in the kingdom they're far richer. When they pray, heaven moves. Do you ever notice when you step outside of the borders of Laodicea that you can take the average believer and he starts praying for people and they start getting healed? Back years ago when I was a part of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association, one of the neatest things they love to do is give the average Joe that all he does is go to church, he's faithfully reading his Bible, he'll support his pastor, he'll say amen at all the right places to make sure the pastor don't look bad, you know. And you take him to Mexico or El Salvador, you just get him outside the United States and that guy starts praying. Now, at first he's scared to death. Come over here, Billy Bob. I want you to pray for this, this woman. She's got cancer. He hears the C word. You can see this fear kind of grip his eyes. I'm telling a true story. Fear gripped his eyes. And trembling, I can't remember if his name was Billy Bob or not, but we're in the Ozarks. Laid hands on this woman. Her belly was swelled up because she had a tumor the size of a basketball in her stomach. He prayed for her, and her stomach went, Phew. Her eyes got big, so did Billy Bob's. <laughs> Looked at his hands and said, Man, where's the next one? Because he stepped outside the religious curtain that we have created in America but the thing is God's calling us to bring back the kingdom here what we see overseas needs to come here we now have ministries in Africa and ministries in South Korea sending missionaries to America to bring us back to Christ and they're being sent to the church hmm Here's the quandary. Here's another paradox you can write down. You can have nothing yet have everything. Or you can have everything yet have nothing. What do you mean? Just do a little research about how many millionaires commit suicide. How many Hollywood stars that have it all and everybody hangs on their word like they actually know what they're talking about when they're not reading from a script. 
How many of them commit suicide? How many of them end up in divorce? How many of them end up strung out on drugs and alcohol because they can't cope with their lives? You can have everything yet have nothing substantial. But at the same time, you can have little in this world and just get by and that's okay. But you become a giant in the kingdom of God that wins souls. I remember James Robinson talked about how God set him free. Now, this was a guy that had, you know, he had his own jet. He was going back and forth in ministry. He, he had the ear of presidents. And God sent a guy that owned a carpet company to deliver him a demons. And he said, maybe you don't know who I am. Do you want to see my card? You want to see our brochure? What do you mean I got demons? And a guy that laid carpet for a living said, God sent me to you and began to pray for him. And he said this pressure that had always been on him began to break and to lift. And that was before, and he was already a big name in ministry. And his flesh wanted to say, why couldn't he send Billy Graham? Why couldn't he send another big minister? A carpet layer. Because <laughs> that carpet layer was big in the kingdom. Heard the voice of God. This is what God said, Jesus says to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. One of probably one of the richest churches in the book of Revelation. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And I'd say he'd say the same thing to the church in America today. I counsel you to buy from me gold tried in the fire, or refined in the fire, that you may be rich. White garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Then he reminds them, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. If, in the days ahead... We have a communist revolution in America. And we're on the point of it. I mean, Bernie Sanders supporters are saying, listen, if he does not get elected, we're going to burn down cities. We're going to have gulags to re-educate all these stupid evangelicals and these conservatives. How many know that's communism with a big, with a big C? If we go that way, it's the church's fault. We were not salt. We were not light. We didn't bring the kingdom. We brought programs. I mean, no, we got programs by the gazillions. You can go into any Christian bookstore and buy entire program packs. Everything from the purpose-driven life to how to drive up offerings. It's all there. Every bit of it. But what is it produced? The very guy that gave us the purpose-driven life is now developing something called Chrislam. How many know the God of the Muslims is not the God of the Bible? No, he's not. And one of the great things right now is the sons of Ishmael are coming home to Jesus in unprecedented scores. One of the greatest threat to Iran is not President Trump. It's all their citizens are becoming Christians by the score so much so that they're, they're complaining about it. What do we do? Thousands upon thousands, even in Egypt. I just read a report this week in Egypt that over a thousand new churches have been established in Egypt. Ishmael's kids are coming home. What we're left with are the children of Esau over there that are the radicals. If in that environment, under Islamic State, if you can have revival, if you can have miracles. I mean, Jesus is showing up in dreams and imams and basically reading their mail and giving them the ultimatum. And they're coming to Christ. I would like that to happen to Washington. It's about time for an angel to visit some of these guys. For them to start having some visions that so unnerved them. Let me show you where you're headed.
If the church will pray, we'll start seeing that. We put our hope in too many things. Now, ministering in the kingdom. In Matthew 10, 7 and 8, he said, "Go as you go preaching, and they were preaching the kingdom, not just quick salvation, but the kingdom. Nowhere does Jesus ever say, go and preach the, king, the gospel of salvation throughout the whole world. He said, preach the kingdom. Now, the kingdom talks about getting saved. Isn't that a great thing? But then it talks about learning how to live life under a sovereign king who rules and reigns in a greater dimension than we have. He says, and, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out de- de- uh, devils or demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Now, Luke gives the exact same story, except he frames it a little bit differently. Heal the sick. This, uh, this is in Luke 10, 9. Heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. How has the kingdom of God come near to them? Because they were carrying the kingdom with them. Now, I want to show you a couple of things that are really cool. First of all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul sharing with those at Corinth. How many know the Apostle Paul could lay down a theological argument like nobody's business? He was trained by Gamaliel. I'm sure he could have debated in the Sanhedrin, and he could have backed anybody into the corner that he wanted. He was brilliant as a theologian. But look at what he came, he said, he said, my speech and my, and my preaching were not with persuasive words of man's, of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He had a bunch of rabbis come down and try to do the rabbi thing on all the new believers. And I tell you what, they're slick. I've met a few. I've dealt with a few. I had one one time contact me and said, I, as, a, as a Gentile believer, now that I'm in Messiah, I had to submit to his teachings because he was a rabbi. And Jesus said, I needed to listen to what the rabbi said, quoting about when they sat in the seat of Moses, you know? Okay. And my response was, well, here's the deal. I know the Word of God. When you sit in the seat of Moses, you're not allowed to give your own opinion. You're only allowed to read the words of Moses. And I said, if you, I said, now you, you sit down and you read Torah, I will listen to you all day long, but I don't have to listen to a word you say once you stand up. Slick words. Slick words. It's got to be in the, in the demonstration of the power of God. Yes, when we hear the word, the word should change us. And I'm not talking about healings every service. Because what happens when everybody's healed? What do you do? I guess we didn't have any power of God today. No. God begins chipping away at the errors in your life. And He changes you. Your heart begins to change towards your family. How many know for some that's a miracle? You become more loving. You become more understanding. That when you pray, the family can feel the presence of God come into a home. That's a miracle. And that's something that's cool that we never have. Now here's the interesting paradox. Are you ready for the, the kicker? Let's go to Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Everybody always likes to read 21, but they never read 20. And it's like playing Jeopardy. You think you got the answer, but you don't even know what the question is. Now listen to what the Pharisees asked him. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Now within the mindset, because you, you've got to learn how to hear through their ears. When a Pharisee in the first century, in the second temple period, said, when is the kingdom going to come, he was speaking of the messianic reign, the messianic age, when God would rule planet earth through the Messiah. 
and that the entire world would be under the dominion and rulership of Almighty God. And it's what the prophets were talking about. And how that even, that, you know, I can, I'm gonna, I, can, I can have a pet tiger if I want to during the millennial reign. It'll be cool. It gives a whole different definition to hear kitty kitty, doesn't it? The Bible talks about how the child will play by the adder's hole. And an adder is one of the most venomous snakes in all of the Middle East. And so he was asking them, when is that going to happen? Because when that happens, then, all, then Israel is restored. The glory of God is here. The fire of God is going to return in the temple of God. Messiah is going to rule and reign. It's going to be an, a, a time of unprecedented peace. That's what they were asking him. They weren't asking him, when can we have service? Or when do I get the Holy Ghost goosebumps? They weren't asking them that. They were asking about the Messianic age. And he says, now listen. He answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, come here or there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now, can you get a handle on that? On the inside of you, in your spirit, the Messianic era has already begun. Where is Jesus supposed to be ruling and reigning? Maybe he needs to split your Mount of Olives so that you get a clue. I don't know. <laughs> He's supposed to be reign, ruling and reigning in here. So on the inside, I've got the Messianic age. And on the outside, I still have this oh yucky age. That's the problem. In space-time or in, uh, temporally, we're still waiting for the moment that Jesus destroys the enemies or the armies of the son of perdition and physically establishes his kingdom. Yet Jesus says, listen, to the believer in our spirits, the reign of Messiah has already begun. It is the messianic reign within. Now here's the quandary. He said, listen, they're going to say, lo, it's over here, lo, it's over there, like the new age. Messiah's out in a desert place. Maitreya, one week and whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's this crazy stuff. Now, the world may run after that. But why is the church running after that stuff? It's because there's no king ruling and reigning on the inside of their hearts. Now, I, it's, it's like with President Trump. I like him. I like that he's causing the blood pressure of all the politicians to go through the roof. It is, it is, it is, it is rewarding to watch. And how that they have violated every law to bring this impeachment because, number one, the, the, what, not one thing they listed is a, a, not only not a violation of the law, it's not impeachable. Sets a scary precedent. And they were celebrating do you, you see the parade when they signed the articles of impeachment? Nancy was giving away souvenir pins. It was a debacle. But see, I don't, my hope is not what happens in Washington. I hope that Trump continues to be the bull in the china closet. And I pray to God when he gets, gets through, there isn't a single piece of china left in that closet. <laughs> But my hope is not there. My hope is in Jesus. It can be toward no man. And I've got colleagues that I highly respect in ministry that I, that I dearly love. My hope is not in them. You know why? Because I know they're like me. <laughs> that, I, that I can get off. I could get ornery. I could get led off down a dog trail somewhere. We all have their propensity. But Jesus can't. And if his kingdom is ruling and reigning within, then my hope is in him and his kingdom and his kingdom working in me. And so on the inside, I've got to live like Jesus is physically ruling and reigning because he is in me. 
that changes everything. I don't fear the deep state. I didn't fear the occult when they were coming after us to try to kill us. Do you know when I'm gonna, you know when I'm gonna go, if the Lord tarries when I go home is when he says that I can go. You know there was a guy named John that they tried to kill really hard. Tradition says that his sentence for preaching the gospel was to be boiled in oil and all he got was a moisturizer treatment. He wouldn't boil. They sent him to the Isle of Patmos because they couldn't kill him. And so this old guy on the Isle of Patmos says, on the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and we get the book of Revelation. How many know that's a pretty doggone good finish? Because the enemy couldn't kill him. The Apostle Paul knew that his time had come. Second Timothy is his last book. And he said, listen, I've finished the race. I have fought the fight. Timothy, there's not a, one last thing that I can do, and I'm ready to go home. And according to Rome's own records, he ran to the executioner. He was ready for his ticket to be punched because he knew he had done everything that he could do. And see, one of my personal fears is I don't want to get to heaven and have this long to-do list that I didn't get done. I want to say like the Apostle Paul, if the Lord tarries, I finished the race. I've wrote all the books. I've done all the conferences. And Mary says, glory to God. There's not, a, there's not a thing left that I can do except just go home. And I'm praying that's in the rapture because Steffi told me she's got this deal with the Lord. It's a, it's a group thing. We all go at one time. But guys, God is calling us to so much more. Now, how do we get there? We go back to the Lord's Prayer. Can I paraphrase the Lord's Prayer to kind of give you an outline? Lord, may your name be holy and feared among the people to include me. Release your kingdom in me now. Bring this earthen vessel in line with your perfect will. Get me in line with you. Boy, isn't that, isn't that a, wouldn't that be a powerful prayer? God, grab me by the ear, grab me by the hand, by the foot, whatever parts you can get a hold of, and get me back in that groove of your perfect will. Supply my needs. Now here's one Mary was talking about, and this is one. How many know that at salvation, Jesus forgive me of my sins? How many know he forgives you right then and there? But how many know there's still a lot of stuff you need to work through? But here's the paradox in the kingdom once you're in you can only achieve forgiveness in the same proportion that you forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we forgive. Unforgiveness will stall you out in your Christian walk. It'll keep you in the nursery and your diaper full. Tommy, no, I'm wanting to get out. I want to get out of the nursery. I want to get out to where I can do some stuff for God. That I can see his healing. That I can, I can see him turn families around, turn lives around. I got a lot of cancers I like to see just dry up and just absolutely confound the doctors. I want to get to where the doctors are sitting there scratching their heads saying, this has to be God. There, nothing goes in instantaneous remission. Oh, by the way, it replaced an organ that it ate up. This stuff doesn't happen. It's got, there's got to be a God. I want that so bad. I want God to rock the medical world. I want God to rock the political world. I want the power of God poured out. Guys, I was in an area over in Germany, and I'm on the, the tail end of a revival that lasted for over 20 years in Germany. And it started by a guy that, guy that was so strung out on dope. And so there's, there was this thing of getting dope out of the concerns. 
He got saved. He started, and all the pushers came to him because he was the main supplier. He says, man, I got something better and it's free. Did you know that 20 years later, that every MP, every military police officer on those concerns in that area had supernatural radar when it came to drugs. If you brought in too much from the drugstore off base, they would pull you over. They were empowered by God. That was still a clean military base. They could get no drugs, no pot, no nothing on 20 years later. And we didn't, I, I saw more healings, more people saved, more people filled with the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't hard because I was riding a wave that faithful Christians in the 1960s had pressed into God and actually fulfilled a prophecy by a Pentecostal preacher that the Nazis had driven out of Germany. That the Nazis feared the Pentecostals. And they drove them out of Germany as they were taking power. And as the last group of, of Pentecostals walked, were forced across the border, one turned and prophesied over Germany and said, the Spirit of God will not return to this country until he comes in the boots of the soldiers that conquer you. And it was the American GI that began to bring revival back to Germany in the late 70s and early 80s. I want some of that now. I don't know what happened, but all the, all the meth just dried up and nobody can get it in the area. And they can't build churches fast enough for all these people. The, the, the people are waking up and saying, I don't need meth, I need Jesus. And they start beating down the doors of the church. And they're having no withdrawal. That's revival. But you know what? I can't do it by myself. Mary can't do it by herself. She's tried. She has prayed and prayed. It takes the body. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. I forgive everybody. And Lord, they, he said, this, the, how many know you're supposed to pray at, at least once a day? So that's once a day, I forgive. And sometimes you've got to grit your teeth, I forgive. <laughs> by faith. Keep them far from my reach because I may lay hands on them, Lord, in the process of this forgiveness. But I choose to forgive. Now take me on to the next level. Because all the glory belongs to you. The kingdom belongs to you. The honor belongs to you. It's not about me. It's about you. That's kingdom. That's one of the things that we learned with the charismatic movement People started praying and people started getting healed. Average people started praying. You know why? Because the moment you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you went from average to extraordinary. You became like Him. And He's just waiting to be released on the inside of you. Now, Father, we thank You for the Word today. Father, let our hearts begin to cry out for Your kingdom. Let our hearts begin to cry out to see your miracle working power for the sake of your great name, that your name would be reverenced among the people. And Father, teach us to forgive in such a way that every root of bitterness is completely pulled out and that we are free to love as you loved. Father, I ask that you would shake this city, that you would shake this state, that you would shake this nation. And Father, one last time before, before the son of perdition comes up, Father, shake this planet with your kingdom and may Jesus receive the greatest harvest of souls he has ever received in all of history, we ask. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering Heaven's call.
there is an end time empowerment coming for God's remnant and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of the end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.